क्या बोलते हैं सबाई <laughs> 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 हेलो <laughs> So many Barbara. groups, BCIC, BSCI, BIT, <coughs> BIT, Sky, ACT, IPD. So you have to manage all the groups. And uh, and uh, uh, I thought after COVID we will take some rest away from the seminar. But after COVID, now the seminar has entered into the bedroom now. Yesterday my wife said he will she will leave me if I uh, again go sure, to the seminar. Sure, sure. On no, no doubt on Friday, the, every wife will be annoyed. So, let so, so we, we Kaisar, could, let 100 flowers yeah. bloom let 100 flowers bloom no problem sir sir now now wives are not happy with flowers sir they are happy with diamond rings sir they are not they are like our mom <laughs> My son was defending. Uh, my wife was complaining. He was saying, "At least he's at home." <laughs> well, I, I, I have happy. only. She is happy that you are at home. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it means, mom, that at least Baba is at home. So oh, I see. <laughs> no, no, no. So it, it is kind of happy. Wife is happy to stay in the home. It, it's kind of. Your ha- wife is happy, na? Happy, sir. This is very good news. <laughs> but without phone without phones <laughs> so we can start now sir yeah uh, dear participants respected expert panelist especially dr professor yeah. daniel chim welcome to bangladesh thank you sir i think we are very grateful to you for your kind consent for the uh, All the panelists here are very well known to you, but for the junior fellows, I just few introduction for you. Thank you, sir. We can. Oh, sir, Dr. Tanya Chim is very much. popular in bangladesh but uh, i picked to go to a living legend is early years uh, he did mbbs and ammet for the national university of singapore in 1987 he did masters of medicine in internal medicine and membership royal college of physicians united kingdom in 1992 and master of medicine in internal medicine and uh, now he is director of national university center singapore senior consultant cardiologist at the same hospital national university hospital and he is a professor of professor of medicine young lu uh, sorry school of medicine national university of singapore he has a lot of experience i think in the is in south asia he did fellowship of american cardiology 2001 fellowship of society of coronary angiography of intervention 2002 Fellowship of Royal College of Physicians in 
training in vascular ultrasonography at St. Vincent Hospital, Sydney, Australia. Carotid stamping at National Taiwan University, Taipei, Taiwan. He's an extraordinary organizer. Everybody will know. He's a great organizer, a chairman of Singapore Heart Foundation, past president of Singapore Cardiac Society, immediate past president of Asia Pacific Society of Indian Cardiology, the APSIC, founding member of Asia Interventional Cardiology Therapeutics. He's a great clinical researcher, teacher, and faculty. Professor Tan is an active clinical researcher. He is regularly invited to lecture are in faculty in many international cardiology meetings. We know everybody. He's a visiting professor in China and University of Mandalay and Myanmar. A great human being like me. He's a, I'm very much fan of Professor Tan. Lots of Bengali, Bangladeshi fellows, faculties. He lo loves Tan because he's a great human being. He's a great clinician, teachers, and cardiologist. But above all, he's a great human being. IPDI wishes his healthy and long life. Welcome, Mr. Ten in Bangladesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Abdul Adil, sir, please introduce him, our faculties, sir. Lots of faculties, uh, please introduce him. Uh, Professor Tan Hechim, I think you know most of our faculties. My teacher, Professor Abdullah Al Shafi Mojundar, who is the General Secretary of Bangladesh Cardiac Society and he's the ex director of National Institute. Professor Abjadur Rahman, He's also an ex director of NSABT. Uh, Professor Mamunu Roshan uh, is professor in NSABT. There is also Kaisan Asullah Khan. Both of them are working in two renowned uh, private hospitals. And many others, Professor Shahbuddin, he's the head of the Department of Select Medical College. Many other faculties are there. And some other are waiting to, uh, they'll be joining shortly because they have to put it actually could not finish their work in time. So, Professor Tan, uh, Tan Hichi, we are really grateful that you have consented to give a lecture to us. And the subject is very important for the fellows. And if they have a good grounding in what to do, particularly in a complex case like bifurcation lesion, that will be very helpful when they become very active. COVID is not going to stay for long. And they have to go back to the cath lab and provide good service to the patient. To that end, I hope your lecture will do a great service. I, uh, I now ask you to start your lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaudhary, uh, for the very kind introduction, and also Dr. Mosi uh, Ahmad for uh, making this uh, possible. It's an honor and pleasure for me to be involved in this uh, interactive professional development initiative. I've always been devoting myself to education of the younger doctors. I'm just glad to be able to share this with our Bangladeshi uh, colleagues as well. So the uh, topic that has been assigned to me is this step-by-step -step manual for planning and management of bifurcation lesions. So what is coronary bifurcation? It refers to a lesion that occurs at or near a division of a major coronary artery. And that coronary bifurcation is characterized by three important anatomical segments, a proximal main vessel, a distal main vessels, and a side branch. And, uh, and along, uh, that, along that, you can please see this. Please, 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 So, the thing about bifurcation lesion is that uh, uh, pathological studies have shown that the arterial branch points are full size of low shear and low flow velocity, and these sites are predisposed to the development of atherosclerotic plaque, thrombosis, and inflammation. And so, the bifurcation PCI is considered a complex and a high risk, high -risk lesion. lesion. It accounts for 15 to 20 percent of PCI. There is considerable variations in the anatomy of the various bifurcation lesions, particularly important in left main bifurcation lesion. The plaque burden and location of plaque is highly varied, and the angle between main vessel and side branch are also very varied. Then we know that in the course of intervention, dynamic changes in the anatomy can occur. Plaque shift may happen, dissections can occur as well. 
And oftentimes in the intervention for bifurcation lesions, we have difficulty in achieving a perfect lumen reconstruction. There's either incomplete coverage of the osteum and also all this result in an increased risk of restenosis. So no two bifurcations are identical. And so an appropriate strategy from the very outset is important and it helps to save life and to minimize complications. So this is the evolution of bifurcations PCIs for many of us who have been around for a long time. In the early days, there's not much of option except for kissing balloon inflation. And we started off with a bare metal stance in the 1990, early 1990s, going on to a DES in the early uh, 20, uh, 21st century, going on to a second generation DES and so forth. Along the way, we come up with techniques of geowire, provisional site run extending, port, final kissing, and DK crush, which has been around since uh, 2010. So it's been about uh, 20, uh, uh, 04. So it's been about 16 years since they've been doing this uh, uh, DK crush. So I think many of us know about this many classifications. Uh, there are so many classifications that uh, we had to deal with in the very beginning. But I think most of us have now settled with this Medina classification. And Medina classifications basically code three numbers. The first number refers to a proximal main branch. Second number refers to the state in the distal main branch. And the third number refers to the side branch. And it gives a, uh, a number to either one, which indicates the presence of stenosis, significant stenosis, or zero for the absence of stenosis. So you get the three numbers. A typical true bifurcation will be a 111, where you have narrowing in the main proximal vessel, distal main vessel, and the side branch. However, all the classifications have a problem. The classifications depends only on angiogram. And we know that the angiogram is very poor in terms of telling you for sure how the plaques are being distributed and the extent of the disease. Oftentimes you will need imaging to gather this sort of information. And this classification, which includes Bundina classification, does not really take into account what happens to a side branch when you dilate the main branch. It doesn't have this predictive ability to tell you whether it is safe to uh, save for the side branch or not. So in a intervention of a bifurcation lesion, I think there are unique challenges. And so these are some of the challenges that we encounter. Uh, we will have to deal with a vessel shape and sizing. So there could be a discrepancy in the diameter between the proximal as well as the distal vessels. There are procedural complications that we have to deal with. Plug shift that can cause a closure of the side branch, dissection, perforation, and sometimes even movement of the uh, artery and during cardiac uh, contractions can also uh, make the uh, procedure highly challenging. There's considerable variations in the bifurcations and lesion anatomy, as I've mentioned, side branch patency, part distribution, lesion composition, angle between main branch and side branch, and the locations of the affected vessel. These are the other multiple challenges in bifurcation PCI, which are broadly classified into two, clinical anatomical variations and procedural options as well. So just imagine you have to think about all this stuff as you consider your strategy and you have to think of all these possible strategies that you can undertake in the doing a PCI for this bifurcation lesion. So I think the approach to bifurcations PCI for particularly uh, the junior doctors is that most of us would adopt what we call a provisional approach. And it is the most recommended approach. And the approach here is really dictated by the side branch. We need to know whether this is a true or not a true bifurcation. What is the size of the side branch, the extent and distribution of disease in the side branch, how important the side branch is for the patient and for that specific anatomy and the angle from the side branch. So I think the provisional approach versus two-stand approach has been tested in many, many earlier randomized control trials. And so if you can see on the left side here, these are the various trials that compare a provisional approach versus a two-stand or systematic uh, Stent, uh, bifurcation uh, stenting approach. And when you look at the primary endpoint, actually most of them has got no significant difference whether you do a provisional or two stent. In fact, BBC once suggests that maybe a provisional approach is a safer option compared to a two stent uh, bifurcation strategy. 
When we follow up Nordic and BBC trial uh, for up to five years, in fact, you can see that the provisional approach seems to have a lower long-term mortality than the systematic dual stenting technique. But is this correct? But you must remember that this is still a very old data that we are looking at and old techniques and so forth. So just looking at individual trials is not good enough. Let's look at meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trials, seven observational studies, nearly 7,000 patients, and look at provisional versus two-stand strategy. And you find that actually provisional strategy seems to be safer with regard to DES thrombosis and myocardial infarction. There were lower incidence of thrombosis and myocardial infarction when you use a single stand strategy. But this is one meta-analysis because when you compare another meta-analysis of another group of uh, trials and patients, you find that in this study, two stand strategies are just as good in terms of target lesion revascularization and stand thrombosis and myocardial infarction and side branch stenosis. So the verdict is really not out here. We don't know whether provisional is really that good and so forth. But I think as far as clinicians are concerned, when you encounter a bifurcation lesion, there are only three choices that you have to decide. One is to just keep the side branch open and do nothing about it, just maintain it open. Two is to do a provisional stand in case the side branch gets into problem, then I deal with it. Otherwise, I leave it alone. Three is to go straight for a two-stand strategy. So these are the basic three choices that we have to make. I think in the first strategy of just keeping the side branch open, but this will be the situations when you have a side branch that is small, it is called osteo or diffuse disease, and is clinically not relevant. So we just simply want to keep the side branch open and we have no intention of putting stands or something or anything else uh, more aggressive in this sort of situation. So the techniques really is quite simple. You just put the wire in both the branches, then you dilate the main vessel, and then after that, you stand the main vessel and you leave the wire in the side branch, and you post dilate the uh, main uh, vessel uh, stage, and then with the side drill wire inside in the side branch. Most of the time, there's no problem in pulling back the uh, side uh, wire from the side branch, and then you just simply keep the uh, side branch open with this side branch wire. Provisional stenting is the next strategy. In provisional stenting, we use it when patient has perhaps a side branch that has minimal disease or only at the ostium and when the side branch is suitable for stenting. So the technique here is you insert a wire into each of the main vessel uh, and the side branches. Then you stain the main vessel with a diameter selected according to the distal main diameter. Then afterward, then you do a proximal optimization technique where you dilate the proximal part of the stent. And then you do a guide wire exchange. So you can actually take out your, uh, uh, your gel wire and then or you can take your main wire and then put it into the uh, side branch or you can uh, take a new wire and go into the side branch. And then you remove the gel wire carefully to avoid abrupt uh, guiding catheter intubation. So you pull the wire, the guide catheter may be sucking. And then uh, finally, you do a kissing balloon inflation if you decide you want to do a kissing balloon inflation. Otherwise, the procedure pretty much ends with this provisional stenting approach. So some people want to do a routine kissing balloon inflation after stenting of the main vessel. Many of us do not necessarily do so. So provisional stenting has got uh, advantages. It is very simple and it's very fast. It's got excellent short-term and long-term results, as I said before. It's got uh, perhaps in the meta-analysis suggested a better long-term mortality isn't even. It reserves all other options. So I can still do a two-stand strategy if my provisional stenting approach uh, fail. And more than 60% of our patients, even with the big bifurcations, of the left main bifurcation, as we call it, can be treated using the provisional technique. So what are the lesions that we will select to do a provisional approach? I think most of us will favor uh, insignificant stenosis at the osteocircumflex when you have a Medina classification of 110 or 100. You have a small circumflex of less than 2.5 millimeter. 
you have a diminutive uh, circumflex which you don't really want to intervene too much. When you have a very wide angle between circumflex and LAD, and you have no committant, concomitant disease or only focal disease in circumflex. So all these lesions would favor a provisional stent approach. Now, when we do bifurcations uh, PCI, we have to consider the difference in terms of the diameter of the main vessels versus the uh, distal vessels in the side branches. In general, we all know from the Finnish law or the Murray's law or whatever law that you come to know about, the uh, main vessel is always going to be larger than the individual side branches. And the main vessel is typically two the size of the sum of the diameter in the two daughter vessels. So two thirds, so this must be always larger in an individually two and two thirds of the size. And this is important because we oftentimes will encourage people to do proximal optimization techniques for the reasons that you want to achieve good appositions in the vessel, particularly in the main vessel. So when you do a port after putting a stent across a bifurcation lesions, while your distal part may be well expanded, the proximal part is severely uh, under expanded. This is where you do take a larger size balloon and you do a balloon inflation in the main vessel in the attempt to fulfill the Murray's law criteria as we know that the main vessel is going to be larger. At the same time, you allow the reconstruction of the initial physiologic anatomy, anatomy of the bifurcation. And by doing a port, you allow your wire to go in and out of the side branch quite easily. So why do we do port? We do it to correct any under expansions in the proximal vessel. We restore the proximal main vessel circularity. You facilitate the side branch rewiring and you scaffold the side branch or osteum with this port technique. Now just a little bit on this port technique here. This is a technique that where you would actually put the distal marker just proximal to the carina. So take a short uh, non-compliant balloon, put the distal marker at the carina so that uh, you, you won't go too far off and uh, go too distally and cause a rupture of the daughter vessel. All right. And so when you want to after port and you want to access the side branch again, you will always direct the side branch through the distal strut of the stent in the main vessel. Now this guide wire exchange where you want to access whether proximally or distally is quite important. Because if you access a patient's, uh, uh, if you access the stent cells <clears throat> which are proximal in the location, you find that you actually create a new carina in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the daughter vessel. If you create, go by the distal cells, you actually provide a scaffold of the uh, side branch, which is much better, which is much uh, in terms of rheology, the blood flow uh, compared to if you go by the proximal stenting. So for all intents and purposes, most of the time we will recommend going by distal uh, cell, except for a DK crush uh, technique, which uh, we'll talk about afterwards. So kissing balloon is another important part of our uh, bifurcation uh, PCI. We, use a kiss, we do kissing balloon basically to modify the geometry of the implanted stand. We want to improve the expansions in the proximal main vessel. Uh, you want to improve also the result in the side branch. Typically, we do a two, use two non-compliant balloon, and the size of which will be sized to the distal vessel and not the uh, proximal vessel. But you can always have a short proximal overlay in putting the two balloons into the main vessel here. All right, so this is kissing below inflation. Most of the time, again, we will not, uh, we will do what we call a two-step kissing balloon inflation. That means I inflate the balloon one time, a high pressure come down, inflate the balloon a second time, high pressure come down in the side branch, and then both going up at the nominal pressure uh, at the same time. So this is what we call a two-step kissing balloon inflation instead of just doing both inflating both at the same time in what we call one step kissing balloon inflation. Some people don't like to do a uh, kissing balloon inflation. Then you can do what we call a port side branch and port technique, which is an alternative. Meaning to say that uh, what we do here is uh, trying to achieve the same thing as a kissing balloon inflation. You want to optimize the final results of a provisional bifurcation stenting 
you want to maintain a circular geometry, you reduce a side branch osteum structure obstruction and reduce the risk of a side branch occlusion. So what do I mean by port, side branch port? Uh, meaning to say that you put a stent in the main vessel, you do a port, then you put a, a wire into the side branch, then you do a, another uh, side branch dilatation, then you take out the balloon and then you finish with another port. So in this case, then you don't have to do a full balloon inflation at the same time. So this is another technique that you can consider if you uh, don't want to do a port technique. Now, provisional approach has got a situations in some cases where you might have to go on to put in a second stand as in a build up or a, uh, or, or a rescue uh, two stands strategy. Uh, it all depends on the series that you are looking at. If you look at the Colombo study, well, 30% of its cases go on to do a, a two stand strategy. But if you look at Pan and Stegen, uh, you find that the crossover is actually very low in a uh, provisional strategy that was decided right from the very beginning. So when do we consider uh, putting a stent into the side branch in a provisional approach? I think uh, all of us will agree that when you have a significant, when you have a significant side branch flow impairment, which is TIMI of rate of less than three, we will consider some kind of rescue stenting if the side branch is large enough. In the presence of a major side branch dissection where you worry about acute abrupt closure, when the side branch is diseased and large enough to lead to significant restore ischemia after stenting of the main vessel, and when future access towards the side branch may be important to the patient, then you might consider a side branch stenting. So when you decided on the side branch stenting after putting a stent in the main vessel, you are basically, uh, you still have three options in terms of bifurcation techniques. You can do a tap technique, you can do a reverse crush technique, or you can still do a culoid uh, technique. And all of them have their own respective advantages and disadvantage, which I'll talk about again uh, later on. But this will have been the build up to stent strategy. Now the third choices in the bifurcation PCI is a two stent strategy where from the very outset, you have decided that you want to do two stent uh, strategy. And two stent uh, bifurcation technique occurs in between 15 to 30% again of our bifurcations PCI. And it's usually considered when the side branch is large, with the more than 50% stenosis extending more than five millimeter beyond the side branch osteum. And typically, technique that we use is often one where the side branch will be stented first and then followed by the main branch uh, in the keloid and so forth. So that will be the technique that most of us would use first. So deciding which two stents approach, you can roughly use this uh, table uh, for your own uh, purpose. Now, first of all, when you look at the anatomy, you ask yourself, are you comfortable and confident in rewiring the side branch? after putting a, main, a stent in the main branch. If you are not confident of rewiring the side branch, then maybe you just go straight to a DK crush. If you are confident of doing a, uh, crossing the side branch after a main branch stenting, then look at the anatomy first. Look at the angle between the two daughter vessels. If the angle is more than 70 degree, you can try a T stand or a tap technique. But if the angle is less than 70 degree, then you want to ask yourself again, uh, is the main vessel and the side branch are of the similar size? If the, the main vessel and the daughter vessels are of different sizes, then perhaps a DK crush or a tap technique is better. But if the daughter vessels are about the same size as the main parent vessel, then you can do a tap or a DK crush or culoid stain technique. So when you have a large discrepancy in the size of the main vessels and the daughter vessels, Kuloid is really not a good choice in that sort of situation. So let's look at uh, this uh, table and you can see Kuloid is good when your side branch is about the same as the diameter of the main vessel and the angle should not be too wide. Uh, the best is less than 55 degree. And uh, uh, you can actually do a provisional approach with the Kuloid stand technique. But for DK crush and for SKS, uh, simultaneous kissing a balloon and fluid stenting uh, technique, you find that there is no provisional approach. You have to just put in the two stents 
right away. When the angle is less than 90 degree, you can use DK crush in any sort of uh, bifurcations uh, anatomy. But if the angle is about 90 degree, then perhaps a T stand or a tap technique is more applicable. So my strategy here is that as the operator, you should know at least one or two types of two stand bifurcation technique. And I always think that it's going to be anatomy driven. So if the angle is more than 70 degrees here between the two daughter vessels, you can consider a tap technique, which is what I will do. If the angle is less than 70 degrees, then I will do what I call a uh, cuboid or a crush or DK crush uh, technique. So let's look at the T stamping uh, strategy here. So when we do T standing strategy, you basically put your, your stand in the main vessel. And then you maintain the wire in the side branch. And then after that, you cross into, once you put in the main vessel, you go into the side branch, you balloon, you dilate, and then you put in your second stand, what we call a T stand technique. So it's used to optimize the side branch stenting. And uh, there is a modified version of T-standing called the tap technique and that you will want to access the side branch through a distal strut. So I want to say that T-standing strategy, while it is actually a good strategy, one of the biggest problems is that when you put a branch, a stent in the side branch, very often you may have a situation where you just about miss the ostium of the side branch, which can be a site of a focal Reach stenosis, as in this particular case that is uh, illustrated. So then people come up with a better strategy to avoid this uh, missing covering of the ostium of the side branch, is what we call a tap technique. So, what is a tap technique? Uh, the tap technique here is uh, described by Dr. Guan uh, from Korea is that first of all, you put a stent in the main branch with a side branch that is gelled in the side branch with a guide wire that is gel in the side branch. Then after you perform uh, putting a stand, you can do a kissing balloon inflation first. We can just simply take a balloon and just open up the side branch. Then you will put your stand in the side branch with a little bit of protrusion into the main vessel. So that's why TAP is called a T stenting and, and small protrusion. You will inflate the stand and then uh, together with the uh, a balloon, that is inflated in the main vessel. So you find that uh, after that, you can just move out everything. So it's actually a very simple technique here. Just simply put the stand in the side branch, do a simultaneous balloon inflation in the main vessel as well in the side branch, and you're done with the procedure. The thing about TAP is that people worry about that protruding part, whether you'll be crushed, whether it will be deformed and so forth. This is a bench testing that tell us that the kissing balloon to post dilatation does not crush the side branch stenting technique. And so tap technique is something that is very popular in Europe. So they don't like DK crush and they prefer step uh, uh, technique. Let's look at cuboid technique. Again, cuboid is something that is very familiar to many of us. First of all, you will dilate both branches. Then you put the stent into the more angulated side branch first. And once you put in the stent, then you withdraw the wire and pass it to the other main vessel, do a balloon pre-dilatation, and then put in your second stent. And then at the end of which, you will cross the wire again with the first, into the first stent, and you do a kissing balloon inflation to finish the procedure. So Culoid was first described by Chevalier and way back in 1998, so that's a long, long time ago. Uh, so the advantage of QLOI is that it allows adequate osteo coverage both in the primary two stand strategy and also as a provisional technique. So the thing about the QLOI is that proximal vessel, which is the parent vessel, have double layered sleeve of stent. This is the biggest contrast to DK crush, where you only have a multi layer of stent on one side of the vessel, and not the entire sleeve of the parent vessel. Both the proximal end of the main branch and the side branch stands will need to be sized up to the proximal vessel. That's why the discrepancy cannot be too large. And both main branch and side branch, as I said, need to be similar in diameter. And you want to have a stand design that have a cell space that can be expanded to the size and diameter of the side branch. 
so this is a uh, uh, illustration of a patients with uh, 111 Medina classification. So you can see that there is actually uh, very tight lesions at the distal lamin and the osteo of the LAD and circumflex artery. And this is the spider view. Again, you can see that there is a severe stenosis, a true 111 lesion. What you do is you put a stent into the side branch first. And then this is a very important technique. As you pull back your wire from your side branch and direct it to the distal cell into the, the other uh, main vessel, you want to make sure that you don't pull the wire out of the stain. So you know for sure that your stain, the wire is always within the stain in the proximal segment. All right. So now you direct into the main vessel, you do a balloon predilatation, you put in your second stain. And then you do what we call a two-step kissing balloon inflation, dilate the main vessel, dilate the side branch, go up together, and then you finish with a port if necessary. So this is the final angiography in this patient who had a two-lot stain technique. And this is the IVA study telling you that uh, the stent is fully uh, expanded in the post, and you find that there is a, a very round, a very round shape, so suggesting that there's very little asymmetry that we are looking at here. So the tumor stain technique has got an advantage, is that it provides a near perfect coverage of the side branch osteum. The disadvantage is that it has got a high concentration of metal with double stent layer at the carina and in the proximal part of the bifurcation, you require rewiring of both branches and you need both stains to accommodate the potential diameter mismatch. Huh? Let's talk about DK crush. This DK crush has become quite uh, well known in recent uh, years. DK crush is a seven step procedure, according to Dr. Chen Shaoliang. Uh, first, you involve a side branch stenting, then you take the balloon and crush it, the balloon in the main vessel to crush it, and then you do your first casing balloon inflation, then you do your main vessel stenting, you do a port, then you do a second casing balloon inflation, it's called, that's why it's called a double casing and then you do a final report. So this is a seven-step procedure. But the uh, Dr. Chen from China, Nanjing, will tell you that uh, DK crush is best supported with a three steps of uh, IVUS or OCT imaging. Let me tell you, uh, show you uh, again one case. This is a patient with a uh, clearly a, a 111 start of a uh, distal left limb bifurcation uh, lesion. After you have wired both lesions and pre deal the lesion, you would suggest that we do a first IVUS to see. Firstly, to evaluate the pre dilatation result, then you want to size this side branch, you want to size the main branch, notice where are the healthy uh, landing zone, whether it's in the proximal or in the distal, and then you want to size the port balloon for the parent vessel. So, this will be the typical images that you will get from a first IVUS uh, imaging after pre-dilating both the uh, side branches. So having done the imaging, uh, you will put your first stent into the main vessel here. So he, here he took a long uh, stent. And then after that, he took the balloon, to, uh, which is sized to the LAD vessel to crush the stent. And then after that, you will take an even larger balloon to crush the proximal part of the stain within the left main itself. So this is uh, important here. So you optimize the complete uh, crushing of the stain in the left main. Now, you have not taken out the wire because he will say that you will leave the wire here and then pass a third wire using this wire as a guide so that you know for sure you are in the proximal cell. And he will recommend doing a proximal cell entry into the side branch. Once you have done your recrossing with a third guide wire, you will do your second IVUS. You will use it to evaluate the crush segment. You will want to see your position of the wire and you want to plan for main vessel stenting. And so this is what he will be getting at in the information. So from the IVUS, he will be able to tell that the wire is in the proximal part of the cells. And so this is in the ideal position in a uh, uh, DK crush uh, technique. So the reason why we always use a main proximal cell instead of a distal cell as we would use in most of the other bifurcation PCI is that in this bench study that we did together, we find that if you cross in the 
proximal cell, there's actually very little gap uh, in the carina area. But if you go by a distal cell, you can actually have a residual gap uh, in the uh, carina area uh, using a DK crush technique. And so that's why the recommendation is always to go by a proximal cell. So this after crossing, we will do our first kissing balloon inflation. Uh, and so this is pretty straightforward. Once you have done your kissing balloon inflation, you are ready to put in your second stent into the main vessel. And so you put a stent first, and this will be the stent results. And after which, we will always uh, port it uh, again in the main vessel. So you will port it in the main vessel, and this is the result. After you have done this, you will now have to recross into the side branch to do your second uh, kissing. But in this case now, you would uh, have to pull up your side branch wire first and then uh, uh, before you do your uh, uh, stamping in the main vessel. So this is a two-step kissing balloon inflation here yeah, and here. And then we finish with a port and this is the final result. So then you should end your procedure with a third IBIS to look for your optimal stand expansion. And in mild acquisition, make sure there's no edge stenosis, there's full lesion coverage, and there's no edge dissection. And so this will be the final IBIS findings, and this will be the angiogram after a DK crush uh, technique. So this is one year follow-up after a uh, DK crush, still looking very good. So the DK crush technique advantage is that it's a very effective technique very effective for large dominant disease circumflex definitely better than the classic crush because in classic crush 10 percent of the lesions you can't cross into the side branch after a, a crushing with a uh, stent in the main vessel the disadvantage is they cannot be performed as a provisional strategy there are multiple steps involved and few operators may have the experience so the outcome as far as dk crush and culoid stent technique is that we know that from a DK crush three, looking at these two different techniques in patients with left main bifurcation, DK crush was superior to culoid stand technique. And the reason why it may be superior is because of this residual necking rings that we see in patients with a culoid stand technique. In the DK crush, there's no napkin ring, ring uh, residual, but in the uh, uh, Kilot, you can see this uh, napkin ring. Whether this is the, the find the reasons for the uh, adverse outcomes, we don't know. But this is something of interest. But for sure, nowadays when we decide whether we want to do one stain or two stain strategy, we can actually predict based on this definition trial. Definition trial has got the criteria that will tell us whether the lesion that you are dealing with is considered a simple bifurcation or a complex bifurcation. And you would define somebody as, as having a complex bifurcation if you have a, one of these major criteria plus two other minor criteria. So these two other minor criteria can be in any of the following. It could be the main vessel length of lesions, it could be presence of thrombus, multiple lesions, and so forth. So by looking at this criteria and testing it out in what we call the definition two trial, which was presented at EuroPCR eCourse this year, clearly a use of a two-stand strategy was superior to a provisional strategy when you are dealing with complex bifurcation lesion with regard to a clinical endpoints of reduced target lesion revascularization and target lesion failure at one year. So now we can actually, instead of just eyeballing, we have objective criteria where we can rely on to ascertain whether a bifurcation lesion is indeed a complex or simple. I want to end on by just commenting a little bit on the imaging guidance. I think IVERS or OCT will be very helpful in any form of bifurcations PCI, and that they will provide a better insight into the plug configurations, which may help actually help you to decide whether to do a two stain or a single stain strategy. And it will help to improve outcomes for sure and allow a selection of an appropriate stamping strategy. And certainly it will also help in terms of aiding the vessel sizing and identify calcifications where you might consider uh, alterectomy. In fact, the use of IVERS has been shown to even have a mortality, mortality benefit in the left main PCI as in the reports published by Park from Korea. So IVERS is certainly something that you will encourage 
in doing a complex bifurcation PCI, particularly involving the lag mean. The other thing about uh, FFR, which I want to touch on here, is that oftentimes when you do a provisional stand strategy, you might find that there is a uh, a uh, plug shape or coronal shape, which causes a narrowing of the osteum in the side branch. And Kuhn did a very important study to tell us that when you have a side branch osteo lesions of more than 75% stenosis, actually two thirds of them are physiologically not significant. That means only one third of patients actually do you have to worry about whether there's ischemia going on and so forth. So for the most part, if the patient has got no symptom, it's got no angina, no ECG changes, and the blood flow is good, I will just leave the side branch alone if I've already decided on a provisional stenting strategy. And certainly when you use FFR, it has been uh, to decide whether to leave the side branch alone and consider a provisional approach or deferred strategy and so forth. It has been validated in at least four clinical trials. So FFR guided revascularization can be safely applied to patients with bifurcations or left mean stenosis. And we know that these bifurcation uh, lesions uh, can be assessed quite uh, accurately if there's no downstream uh, significant stenosis. Uh, IFR has not been used to evaluate the bifurcation lesion at this point in time. So in conclusion, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and everybody, uh, all my friends here, I think the goal of PCI in bifurcation lesion is to attain uh, optimal results in the main vessel and to maintain the physiologic patency of the side branch. The planning of the strategy upfront is critical and knowledge of all possible BOR techniques must be kept in mind. You must have at least two, two, two stand strategy up in your sleeve as you consider complex bifurcation PCI. So while the provisional side branch standing should be the default strategy for low risk bifurcation, a two stance technique may be preferable for high risk or true bifurcations. Although evidence is <coughs> lacking as to the superiority of one two stand technique versus other, I personally feel it is unlikely that any single two stand technique will be superior in all bifurcation uh, morphology. Depending on your own preference, DK crush technique seems to be the most favored but tap technique and culoid techniques are also excellent options, in my opinion. And the decision as to which two stem strategy to use should be driven by the bifurcation morphology, the operator experience, and the clinical trial data. And finally, employing imaging as well as uh, physiologic assessment plus arthrectomy to save time and optimize accounts will be something that uh, I would highly encourage. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Excellent presentation, sir. I think all the panelists and participants will enjoy it. Uh, this you lecture in the archive, in the IPD archive. I think all the junior fellows also learn a lot at the evening or night time when they are very lax. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Abdul Rahman, sir. Uh, Professor Abdul Wadi Chudi, sir. Professor Abdul Wadi Chudi, sir. I think. So one of the beauty of this lecture is he did not make things complicated. So a very simple viewpoint he started and then go into detailing what to do. And the technique of doing one step after the other, that's the way of uh, doing things. You have to have a very clear cut idea what you want to do. And always when you want to do bifurcation stenting, particularly in left main, you should not do it at an ad hoc basis. It's better to have a very pre-planned uh, uh, arrangement of everything at hand so that you can actually go ahead without any complication. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tan Shahim. It's a very nice and detailed lecture and uh, it will be very helpful for the junior colleagues. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. One of the experienced operator and organizer, Professor Dr. Abzal Rahman, sir, with us. Please, sir, uh, you like bifurcation always. You love bifurcation. Please, a few comments regarding the lecture, sir. Yes, <clears throat> Professor Tan, thank you. This is a very brilliant lecture, I would say that. Uh, because um, you pinpointed the thing <laughs> rightly and uh, you make the thing very simple. The way you are dealing gets really appreciated. So I personally like the provisional stenting. And most of the time, if you think like you, like what you most of the um, most of the bifurcation can be dealt with the by 
provisional standing, even 80 to 85 percent cases. Mm -hmm. So only five, 10 percent or 20 percent cases you need a double standing strategy. And uh, you have demonstrated that the several way of the doing a double standing strategy, either decay crash or mini crash or fluor or tap technique, starting from the. But uh, which uh, technique you are comfortable? I think so. The operator should do that. If you are comfortable with decay crash, you should go for decay crash. If you are not comfortable with coolot, you should not go for the coolot. So starting of the coolot, maybe you convert some. Another thing you stress, you give the impression that imaging has a role, especially in the setting of the double standing stress strategy. But provisional standing strategy, I think so, because in our country, it is very difficult to cope with the financial problem is very difficult. So, uh, uh, IVAS or OCT and in all that is very difficult. And the people like you, you can uh, do the uh, complicated process even with the, um, you know, without imaging, that's right. Suppose you are a very expert. If I say that this is a decay crash, the left pain, uh, you should do it without imaging. Are you ready for do that or not? For you, not for I me. <laughs> I could, but I prefer to use image. Okay, that's it. That is that is the that is a very and uh, the recommendation is class two A. So uh, the expert like him can be done, but should be do with the image. And thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for a great lecture. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Mijamaluddin, sir, Director NACBD, uh, with us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moshin. Thank you. Professor Tan Hussein, your lecture is, uh, Professor Abdul Rahman sir has commented very nicely and your lecture is excellent and you have uh, done, you have given the lecture uh, simple case, um, uh, complex case by simple way. That is the beauty of your lecture. Uh, so far, I have also noticed and you have done it very simply, uh, different stages, tap, to pull out, decay crash, everything you have mentioned, whatever in the book or whatever in your practice. But we also uh, do the uh, bifurcation cases, but uh, I do agree, mostly agree with Professor Abdul Rahman sir. In most of the cases, we try to do provisional stenting. If not possible, uh, we try to, next we try to uh, do tap. And if that is also not possible, then we try to uh, try for decay crash but coolot is a bit cumbersome for me i do not i have done few cases but i am not uh, well oriented with coolot so i also like decay crash and decay crash result is also good and uh, the imaging is also very essential which is at least available in our institute by the by the uh, uh, professor abjal rahman who has uh, given us this in our institute thank you all thank you professor tan Huisim. once again for uh, your nice lecture. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dr. Maunish Sijar. Professor Dr. Maunish First of all, thanks to Professor Tam for your brilliant lecture. Uh, with yeah. the previous comments of the Professor Abdul Rahman Sar and Min Jamardin Sar, that you present the complex thing in a very simple way. Uh, regarding the um, bifurcation PCI, uh, with your uh, consensus, we also believe that the provisional stenting is the should be the choice. Uh, around 80% of the bifurcation lesions can be treated by the provisional stenting technique. And regarding the uh, if uh, angle of the bifurcation is uh, suitable, then tap can be, we can be done. And like Mid uh, Jamaluddin Sar, we are not uh, habituated so with the Kulot technique uh, due to the um, crossing difficulties of the uh, OR. And we did DK crash. And uh, imaging is very helpful for the uh, bifurcation lesion PCI. And you are correctly said that many of the bifurcation lesions can be treated by the professional is tainting if the imaging shows that uh, with around your uh, showing that uh, with the 75% stenosis of the osteomalacia, maybe the 20% only have the really significant lesion. So 
the imaging can be very helpful for determining the procedure of the bifurcation lesson. Thank you again, Tan, for your brilliant lecture. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tan, I just would like to comment on the tips and tricks of Kulut, Kulut technique because I think a few operators are uh, worried about Kulut technique. Few comments for the fellows or were not accounted to Kulut technique. Please few comments on Kulut technique again. <coughs> Actually, I grew up uh, learning the cuboid stand technique. So, where then because of familiarity, you become uh, not so worried about it. I, I feel that the beauty of a uh, cuboid stand technique is that it ensures that the cover of the ostium of both the uh, branches very well. Uh, but the biggest downside is that downside is that if the mid vessel is much bigger than the side branch, then cuboid technique is really not a good choice because your stents may not be able to expand fully in the main vessels. But otherwise, it's actually not as uh, difficult as DK crush. Actually, I find DK crush more steps than uh, a cuboid stent technique. A cuboid uh, technique actually got five steps, but DK crush has got 10. But whether it's five, seven, it really doesn't matter. Whatever techniques that you choose, you have to do it meticulously and you have to carry out every step, whether in terms of passage of the wire into the side branch to the distal cells or the proximal cell, optimizing the techniques, uh, optimizing the uh, stand deployment, doing a proper kissing and port and so forth. So whatever techniques that you use, as long as you do it meticulously, step by step, you will achieve the, the as good an outcome as any, anybody else. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Orun Maske is the Nepal, uh, I think, faculty with us. Dr. Orun Maske, That's welcome to our session. Dr. Orun, Professor Orun, yeah. please, any comments or any question for the... Oh, there is not, nothing to talk yes. about. Dr. Tan, your lecture was excellent. And you have uh, given lecture in a, such a simplified way. I think there is nothing much to ask to you. You are an expert. You are a good academician and teacher. I would like to thank from my colleagues from Nepal for training our young residents in Singapore. That's a great job you have done. And thank you, sir. Thank you for your lectures. So we hope you would be training our further uh, good number of residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 Dr. Khaled Bosu, sir, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Tan. Uh, for uh, describing all the techniques in a very neutral manner without expressing your personal preference to any of the techniques. This is a very nice way of uh, disseminating knowledge, actually. I would like to ask you a question. Suppose in a situation of primary PTCA with the LAD D1 bifurcation, 111, with an angle of about uh, 65 degrees, what will be your preferred technique in a primary PCI situation? not in an elective situation. In an emergency situation, I'm trying to save life. So yeah. I'm not uh, going for perfect uh, results here. Provisional strategy will be my first choice. Sir. If I can just keep the side branch open, I'm quite happy. Now I'm just deal with the LED first. So no, if you have to use two stand, what will be your uh, strategy in a primary PCA? In a uh, angle that is 65, as you mentioned, it will either be a culoid or a DK crush. Would you attempt DK crush, uh, which might be a bit time consuming in an emergency situation? Um, no. So I will go with something that I'm familiar with. So provisional followed by culoid if necessary. Thank you. Uh, Thank Professor Chavadin Talib, sir, do you hear me? Please unmute yourself. Professor Shahab, uh, please un you have to unmute yourself, Shahab Bhai. Yeah. Okay, now? Okay. okay, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tang, for your beautiful and um, delighting presentation. Stabilized by the approach of a bifurcation relation in a simple way. Uh, many things have been discussed already of my colleagues, but I have one question regarding the distal start. Uh, crossing is very important to prevent the uh, 
position of the star in the main vessel, prevent the endothelization and the occlusion, and keep the carina. What is your strategy you take, whether it is in the distal star or in the proximal star? On the one is the eye or your angiographic view or your eye was strategy? What is the strategy of what option you take? Rewarding so, the wire. Yeah. Rewarding the, the second one, whether either in the distal start or proximal start. Because it is very important. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. So most of the time we will use angiogram to uh, to determine whether our wire is in the proximal or on the distal cell. And I think most of the time angiogram would be uh, able to give that uh, information. However, if you are already having a OCT or NIVERS on the table right from the very beginning, certainly using it as an additional guide as to which position is your wire is, uh, is even more uh, helpful. But I would say that most of the time I would try to use angiographic guidance and it's also by the techniques that I would employ. So I will shape the wire to go down to the main vessel first and then pull back to redirect into the side branch instead of going straight away into the side branch where you may actually enter into the proximal cell. So by technique, by angiographic guidance, and perhaps by imaging guidance will be my order of, uh, of uh, steps in uh, trying to achieve a distal cell uh, passage. Uh, one important, uh, Dr. Parat Karki from Nepal, he was asking, when size of main branch, main vessel and side branch is not equal, can you still do cool off by stating the small vessel first? So in that case, you have to make sure that the stand that you choose is able to be expanded to the size of the main vessel. Sir. So the, while the side branch may be, say, perhaps smaller, but this stand is capable of being expanded to a large diameter in the main vessel. So if the discrepancy is not so huge beyond the uh, stretching uh, uh, capacity of the stand, then you can actually use a culoid stand technique. And I'll have to say that most of the stand now can be extended really big. For example, if I use a cobalt chromium, I know that I have a thicker 2.5 stand, I can go up to 3.7, a trio stand can go up to 4.2. So really, uh, it has made life a lot easier for many of us now with this new design stand. Another question is, uh, what are the indications to stand side branch when doing provisional strategy? You have gone for the provisional strategy, but you have later decided that you have to do the side branch as well. Uh, what will be the conditions? The question was asked by uh, another student. Uh, so first of all, you have to decide on the indications uh, first. So do you really need to intervene in the side branch, having already decided from the very beginning you want to do a provisional? So it must be a situation where there's severe ischemia going on in the side branch or where you fear losing the side branch in that sort of situation. Once you have established the indications, then you can use a couple of techniques, again, depending on the anatomy. It could be a, a tap technique, which I would prefer. Uh, given that the stand has already been put in, it's much easier, just a one-step procedure, followed by a kissing. Or you can, of course, go to your reverse crush and your culoid technique, which will be a little bit more complicated. So by and large, I think when you have a stand that has been put into the main vessel and you're trying to intervene in the left main, if the anatomy permits, I will just do a simple tap technique. And this will be actually what the Europeans will recommend most of the time. Dr. Tang. Uh, let us say there is a side branch, the side is around, uh, around 2 millimeter. On the osteal tight lesion, we go for provisional stenting, uh, going for the uh, main vessel stenting. Do you want to predilate the side branch beforehand? As you fear, there is a constriction, and before, after provisional stenting, you may not enter the uh, osteum of the side branch. Do you want to do that? In general, if you are doing a provisional strategy, we will not touch the side branch uh, at exactly. all. Exactly. Uh, however, if you want to go by the first techniques, uh, which I recommended, then you want to keep the vessel open because it's so small. At the same time, I don't want to put in stand, but on the other hand, I don't want to lose it either. Then we can do things like what we call a gel balloon technique, where you just take the balloon, pack it by the side branch, inflate the stand in the main vessel, and then after the use a main vessel, uh, use a side branch balloon to inflate a little bit, 
and then you pull back the side branch balloon and then you go high pressure on your main branch. In that case, you will always preserve the patency of the side, side branch vessel. If you have no intention to put in stents at all. Yeah. Dr. Kaiser Masulagan. Dr. Kaiser Masulagan. Uh, Assalamu and good afternoon to all. It was a splendid lecture by Tan Wichim, as usual. Learned a lot from you. And definitely, bifurcation relation is a challenge for everyone, be it left wing, be it side branch. But uh, my take is that keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go for the next uh, few two cases, sir. Do you permit Dr. Pavitan? You see the two cases for the young cardiologist from Bangladesh? They are yeah, uh, young sure. budding list. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shori Islam, Rathon, please uh, share your screen. Please can share. Are you hearing me, sir? Yes, you go. Honorable sir, persons. Honorable sir, persons, moderator, panelists, my teachers and colleagues, good afternoon. I am Shoriful Islam, presenting the case. My case title is The Sailor in the Deep Sea. This is the big clinical history. Mrs. X, non-diabetic, non-potensive, 75, 70 years female, presented with central chest pain, which corresponds to CCS class 3 for 12 hours and diagnosed as a case of unstable angina. On examination, patient is hemodynamic. The echo shows biochemistry reveals normal and ECG changes, non specific HTT changes. Echo shows anterior local hypokinesia with LBA 48%. And this is the invasive test report. Invasive test, test report shows that this is the lemon by. Uh, do you do you skin uh, large, please? The lesion involving the distal lemon and osteoproximal LED and LCX lesion having 80 to 90 percent stenosis. Size protocol. Today, we discuss this is the bifurcation classification. Size protocol. Sir. Yes, This is the bifurcation classification system. Uh, this is the Modina. Yes. This is the bifurcation classification system. This is the Modina classification already discussed by the Professor Tan. And this is the bifurcation PCA algorithm systems. And this is the double external strategy involving the lame main bifurcation systems. From the above angiographic picture, now what, you, what to do? Now we keeping this view in mind, this is the Mudina 111 classification, this is the diameter of the vessels, length of the lesions, angle of the vessels, and supply area of the myocardium. We decided to do a standard strategy and we choose for the decay crash. And this is the Europcr seven step procedure of the DK crash. Now this is the coronary weight preparation by wearing and pre dilatation by two into ten size balloon at ten atm pressure. And on the top of the right side indicates the numerical value of the steps of the DK crash. Insert the main vessel balloon at or distal to the origin of the side balloons and side balloon stands what was deployed. The, this is the crashing of the side branch stand. First DDR and first 
teaching balloon inflation. This is the deliver the main vessel strand. The strand size was 3 into 33 millimeter at 14 atm pressure. Then post dilatation was done of the male vessel, including passport. Then second wear of the side branch through the main vessel stent and remove the side branch wear. And second kissing balloon inflation was done. And this is the final step of the decay crash report. And this is my crash and this is your crash. The take home message is that bifurcation solution PCI is a complex procedure associated with more sense of reestenosis and reinfraction. If two extended strategy is needed, DK crash provides a viable and data driven option. Six plans is compatible, more reliable final kissing inflation, better side balance distance coverage, largely independent of angle. DK crash is effective double external strategy where carrying of the wiper question will maintain and, and this is the DK crash team and thank you all. Stop share. Share stop, uh, Dr. Professor Ten, do you comment? Yes, I, uh, I was just looking at the DK crash thing here. Uh, as you crush your first with the balloon, actually, you don't have to pull out the wire from the side branch. <clears throat> you can leave the wire there as you crush the yeah, uh, stand because that wire will help you to guide your next wire going into the proximal cell of that crush stand. So uh, uh, you don't have to worry about not oh, being able to pull back the uh, wire okay, later push. on because the amount of material, stand material, that is crushing on the side wire is actually very little. So you don't have to worry about that. So just leave the wire there uh, after you have crushed with the balloon and then use the uh, uh, next wire uh, to go down with the first wire as a guide. Any comment, Dr. Arun Maske? Arun Maske, the comment? After getting comment, export comment from Professor Tan, there's nothing to comment. Yeah, it's good, whatever you've done is good. And only is, in our setting, like uh, if you're doing in Western country, you do with IVAS. And our setting, we do not do with IVAS. My question mm. to Tom is how comfortable would he be doing uh, this sort of bifurcation lesions without any amazing techniques? If you think angiographically good, are you comfortable? Mm. Like, likely, likely question, sir. Without imaging possible decay crash, usually you do the all lip main decay crash. It's possible on the imaging. Or Iba City, sir, what was it then? I think it's possible. It's just that you will have to, you can even use QCA on the uh, on your machine software to measure. Otherwise, I think in an experienced operator, visual estimate can be pretty good as well. But we tend to be a little bit uh, uh, more conservative in the visual estimate. So perhaps you want to make sure that you choose a balloon particularly in the uh, main vessel to be sized at least two-thirds of the sum of the diameter of the two daughter vessel. So you want to have a good uh, size balloon in the proximal parent vessel for a final port when you do a DK crush uh, technique. But otherwise I feel that uh, imaging is not 100% uh, uh, needed in an experienced operator. You could possibly do it as well. Thank you, I would say that some proctoring will be very helpful if you're doing it for the first time. Maybe work with somebody senior if you don't have image to guide you. Thank you. Professor Dr. Fazila Malik with us. Madam, welcome. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Fazila. Hi, how are you? <laughs> very fine, thank you. Singapore looks really good. I mean, you're all dressed up and <laughs> dapper and gave a great lecture. So. Congratulations on a great presentation. I'm sorry I got a bit delayed, got stuck with the case, but um, yeah. but that was a very good observation that you said that imaging is not absolutely mandatory. Yes, because for in Bangladesh also like imaging is an issue because it is expensive 
and in many centers imaging is not very readily available so uh, i mean uh, imaging is great but if you don't have it it should not limit an experienced operator as you rightly pointed out yes yes so any Thank plans you. of coming to visit bangladesh once the covid situation uh, resolves a bit yes i look forward to that <laughs> Yeah, well, and we invite you, and it's great that we can see you virtually. So thank you for coming at least virtually to Bangladesh. We really appreciate that. Thank you. It's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to be able to see so many friends as well. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We go for yeah. next case, Dr. Mahmoud Hassan Khan. Uh, please go to the next case. Yeah. Put the first leg. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Honorable uh, chairperson, my teachers, learned panelists, Assalamualaikum, and a very good afternoon. I am Dr. Mahmoud Hassan Khan on behalf of Department of. Clinical and Interventional Cardiology Evercare Hospital, Dhaka. I am presenting a case on complex bifurcation PCI. Our patient, 67 years old, hypertensive female, admitted and treated as a case of non ST elevation, ACS. She has history of PCI to LED in 2006 and 2014. Her ECG showed OLMI anterior and echo showed with a regional one motion abnormality, ejection fraction was 40%. Relux CAG done in our center showed she had double vessel coronary artery disease involving the distal left main. Syntax scoring done, it was shown that uh, syntax 1 was uh, 34 and uh, syntax 2 uh, preferred uh, treatment of uh, mod treatment modality was CABG. As uh, per uh, 2018 ESC guideline for myocardial revascularization, left main coronary artery disease with high syntax score, CABG is preferred one, that is class 1A. Patient and family were not keen on undergoing CABG, opted for multivessel PCI. As we know, the Medina classification for bifurcation lesion, a true bifurcation involves both the main and side branches. As you can see, our patient, according to Medina classification, has 110. So, what will be the strategy? Provisional stenting using a single stent or a two stent approach? Coronary bifurcation PCI algorithmic approach, we all know that if the side branch needs to be preserved, likelihood of, uh, then we need to uh, consider the likelihood of side branch occlusion. If it is high, then uh, plan to stent strategy. If low, then provisional side branching, side branch stenting. So we opted for a single stent approach for this lesion. Preferred choice of technique was provisional single stent technique. These were the hardwares used. So uh, initially the uh, wiring and predilatation of the main branch and side branch. Then we have done the IVAS. Yeah. 
then the positioning of the main branch stem from left main ostium to led deployment of uh, main branch stem was done now the ostium of the circumflex mean significant rewiring of the uh, side branch through main branch tent pre dilatation was done after pre dilatation there was still significant pinching of the sac ostium another i was run was made and it showed the significant ostial pinching of sarc pre dilatation of sarc ostium continues kissing will done still we try to open the strut and uh, dilate the uh, sarc ostium port being done after port still there was significant pinching another ivas run being done and it also showed that there was significant pinching after port so uh, we decided for a second stent in sarc positioning of the uh, sarc stent was been done then uh, circumflex uh, stent been deployed <coughs> kissing done after kissing there was a report after report it's quite eye soothing final i was run been made which showed good stent apposition with no malapposition of stent structures this is the final scene which showed timidity distal flow with good revascularization so what study says cardiovascular outcomes associated with crash versus provisional stenting techniques for bifurcation lesion a systemic review and meta analysis they showed in patients with coronary bifurcation lesions undergoing pci crash stenting technique was associated with significantly lower major adverse cardiac events and repeated revascularization without any change in mortality myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis when compared to provisional technique showing a benefit of crash over the provisional stenting technique during pci comparing two stent technique versus provisional stenting technique in bifurcation coronary artery lesion they showed in uh, developing countries with limited resources the strategy of des implantation in the main branch with provisional stenting of the side branch for the treatment of bifurcation lesions should be the preferred strategy and final kissing when in post dilatation is mandatory when using a two stent strategy provide significant reduction in main branch and side branch restenosis must be performed optimally using appropriately sized balloons sequential high pressure balloon dilatation of the side branch stent then the main branch stent finalized with lower pressure kissing balloon dilatation so my take home message is single stent strategy appears to be less complicated try to keep the procedure simple there should be a plan b and try to keep your head cool every approach is overlapped with each other according to situation single stent approach can be turned into a two stent strategy or an fkdi are essential i was guidance is mandatory when
between complex left main and non left main bifurcation lesions i was guidance leads to a lower mesh rates lead to decreased rate of stem thrombosis and target lesion revascularization thank you all thank you for your patient sharing thank you thank you mahmud excellent case professor tan did you comment the the uh... The, the narrowing of the osteum of the complex come as a surprise to you. It, it, it was shocking. It was shocking because because the osteum uh, pre uh, procedure the osteum of uh, sarc was so healthy and it, uh, we didn't even think of going for a two stem strategy. Straightforward, we plan for a single stem strategy. Mm. But when okay. when when we inflate the stem in the main branch. The sar costium, we uh, uh, we just uh, shock and say, "Oh my God, what's going on?" Could it be just a carina uh, shift? Yeah, carina uh, shift. It may be, but uh, probably uh, my uh, operator uh, uh, decided that it may be due to the distal left main plaque shifting to uh, sar costium. Hmm. Sir, I have a question, sir. But I was. How you determine that is black shift or carina shift? I think this I was shows the carina shift uh, in the different views. I think you see carina shift. If carina shift, uh, don't bother about the another stem. You comment, sir. Then. Yes. Yeah, so if there is no obvious, because if you do, I was you would have seen the anatomy and the plaque location from the very beginning. And if your plaque location is on the opposite side of the vessel, which is most of the time from the origin of side branch, it is very unlikely that it is the plaque shift that causes a narrowing of the lumen. Oftentimes, as we know, it's really from a carina shift. When you start doing ports in the proximal vessel, it always looks like that. And if you do a FFR down the side branch, you'll find that actually it's not so, uh, it's not so worrisome. And so, if you don't have a FFR, then I would uh, look at the patients carefully and, and, and see whether there's symptom of ischemia and so forth. But you have made the call that this is significant uh, based on the angiogram and deal with it uh, nicely. Uh, I think it's a reasonable one because circumflex is a huge vessel in your case and we just can't afford to lose it if it's fully ischemic. Everywhere else, I might just leave it alone, but because this is a big bifurcation, I will be very cautious to leave it alone. Thank you, sir. Uh, Officer Mahmoud Rishit, sir, do you comment? Um, uh, regarding this case, the FFR is um, mandatory for doing to see the ischemia of the SARS. Not mandatory, but if you have it, uh, it will help you to make a decision as to whether this is true plaque shift causing narrowing or it's just a carina shift, and in which case uh, uh, I don't have to do anything about it. Yeah. So uh, if you have a pressure wire, that will be excellent. But if not, uh, if you can do a proper good job of doing a two stand technique, because this is a big bifurcation, just go ahead and do it. I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be. Uh, fighting with you or something like that. Uh, if FFR is available, then FFR should be done. It will be a good decision, Yatan. Uh, that will be evidence-based, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Professor Mijjaman, sir, do you comment, sir? Thank you. Uh, I, I am on the way of another um, case, and that is why my mask is here. I do not know whether you are hearing me or not. Are yeah, you hearing me? You are hearing yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a nice case. But I do agree with uh, Tan. This case, uh, we if available, there is uh, FFR. FFR wire could be done, uh, and FFR should be done. And with FFR, I think it is not um, essential to do another stent. If there is ischemic three flow, there is uh, uh, no uh, significant narrowing of the ostium, and FFR will uh, give the result whether second stent will be necessary or not. If it is not available in the lab at that time, then a two stent strategy can be done. And case is uh, nicely done. Excellent job. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shabuddin Did you uh, Thank okay? you very much. Thank, thank, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I am the operator of this passion.
actually after putting the first step fashion was become very symptomatic and potential that is this phase so we don't bother for putting the second step next we clinical assessment is the best assessment forget about the physiology first you assess the patient clinically on the table so we right. immediately take the patient for second step yes you are very right and after putting second step patient become asymptomatic and nicely recovered and Uh, yes. Professor, Professor Abdul Rahman sir, that's what actually Professor Tanhui Chima assess the patient clinically. If the patient, today, patient is being fine, then do FFA. If the patient is unstable, that means you don't have to do FFA. You know that there is something critical wrong. You have to go for two steps. Forget about physiology. First, assess the clinic. Assess the patient clinically. Right. Very right. Right. Professor Abdul Rahman sir, do you hear me? Professor Abdul Rahman sir, uh, Doctor Arifu Rahman, I think uh, any question left in the chat box, Doctor Arifu Rahman, Shajal. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, first, I like to thank Professor Tanwar Jam sir. It has been a very great lecture, and we have learned a lot. There are lots of questions. I am uh, asking a few of them according to importance, sir. Yes. Arif, sir, I am uh, preparing, sir. sir uh, there is a Arif? question in the ask by uh, yeah. Abdul Lal Munjur. Yeah. Uh, in case of DK crash, rewiring through distal strut, and in case of provisional proximal strut is preferable. Is it? Uh, do you prefer this uh, statement? Oh no. So I think for DK crash, we will prefer a proximal or uh, mid cell uh, entry. Any anything else? Uh, we will go for a distal cell, like a provisional strategy. So, uh, only for DK crush do we go for proximal and mid cell approach. Nice proximal mid for DK crush. Take our next question. So DK crush, you prefer for the proximal crush. Thank you, sir, for the information. The another question uh, from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nizam. He uh, he mentioned there is a chance of thrombus formation in case of cap technique. Uh, due to proximal protrusion, uh, how far you uh, face this situation? Uh, actually, there has been quite a number of studies comparing the risk of stent thrombosis between provisional and two stent, uh, and actually there have been no difference uh, found if the techniques is properly performed and carried out. So I don't think that there is an increased risk of stent thrombosis with a two stent if you do it well. Did after the case. The chances of a significant protrusion uh, doesn't actually arise. You are actually right. smoothing out the orifices, making it more circular. I think this first happened most of when we use the old old hardware. Yeah. There is a question from uh, Chayam Singh from BSMMU. Uh, he wanted to know uh, the, about the imaging technique. Uh, about the imaging technique, you mentioned. If there is no chance or uh, availability of imaging, then whether we should go for bifurcation uh, procedures or not, or that there is implication of outcome of the success rate. Uh, I think we said before, if there's no imaging to, uh, equipment available, uh, you can still go ahead and do your PCI, uh, but you will want to make sure that you have a good. Uh, High pressure balloon inflation to make sure that the stent is fully expanded and you observe every step uh, carefully. Uh, I don't think the uh, absence of any imaging modality precludes the performance of a bifurcation PCI. Thank you, sir. It will be of great help for the beginners. There's a question from Tanvir Ahmed from United Hospital. He wanted to know if he planned for DK crash and we failed to recall the well. In that situation, which bailout procedure you prefer? So after DK crush, you can't cross into the side branch again. Yeah. In the first crossing or the second crossing? Sir, the first cross, no. cross, first crossing, sir. Actually, hundred percent of the time you can cross, sir. That's uh, so that's the beauty of DK crush. Take your time, do it slowly. You will be able to. Uh, cross it uh, in a classic crush, ten percent. No matter how hard you try, you will not be able to do it. But in the DK crush, you will be able to do it. So take your time. Uh, 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 I think that's the question uh, for the juniors. 
we are passing about right. two hours time. Mr. Uh, Abdul Rahman, from your last comments from you, uh, this program and uh, last program for for junior colleagues. No, thank you very much. Uh, this is really good session, I think so. And uh, Tan giving a lot of instruction, but we want to see in Tan in uh, in person. So hoping to see you in February five, six, and seven. I think so. It is it, it is in, in your casual. So at the time COVID will be solved. So I think so that will be the first conference, international conference after the in COVID. I think so. So thank you, Tan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Don't know what. Hello, Tan Ben. Apna their border cool be kabe. Hi, your border open, sir. I learned something. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Ten, your uh, comments for the fellows and uh, junior fellows that are doing the cat labs in the same procedure, and they should knowledge, skill knowledge before doing the complicated case. Thank you, your comments, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, this is an excellent uh, learning session uh, for you to be able to be exposed to some of the uh, uh, insights from many of the experts here. Uh, I think that is a good start for you to learn. And after which, I would encourage you to uh, go through again the slides and the videos and so forth. And have, have it in your mind the steps that you will need to take uh, in assessing the uh, bifurcation condition, what sort of a technique to do, and if it's a technique that I want to do, what are the steps involved and so forth. So go through your mind. Uh, if you can get hold of a model to work on it, that will be better. But otherwise, uh, Talk to your uh, colleagues, learn from your uh, teachers and so forth. Uh, master one instance technique first before you go on to another one and then do it step by step in a graduated fashion. I think you will, you will find that bifurcation PCI is not that difficult after all. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are grateful thank to you. you. Sir. We are uh, lots of time giving to for the us and also junior fellows. I think they are enriched your knowledge. And if this you lecture in the IPDR archive, they can go run through, go through this lecture repeatedly. I think they are they will be benefited. Thank you, Professor Abdul Wadu, sir. You conclude the session, Wadu, sir. Uh, Professor uh, Tanvi team has given an excellent lecture. Everybody is saying that, and everybody is saying it will be helpful to the fellows. But I do think it will be actually also helpful for us as well. Because the level of expertise he has acquired and the level of expertise we aspire to, there's always room for improvement. Uh, we'll be doing that by going to this lecture ourselves and using the knowledge that we acquire from the discussion we have. But most important thing I think is that we always should have a very clear idea of what I want, what I can do. And we should be always uh, have a clear idea of our own limitation, whether I am the operator who can do this particular case. There are bifurcation and there are bifurcation. Some everybody can do, some very few experts can dare to do. And that demarcation, that understanding actually comes with the knowledge. And today's lecture is a very good my step in that and we we are going to have clear idea how to do a bifurcation lesion, which sort of uh, bifurcation technique we are going to do and then plan accordingly. Professor Tanhe Chin, we are really grateful to you and we do hope we'll be getting you again and again in different way, in different academic fora, we'll be getting and share, we will be sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, everybody, especially Professor Ten. I also thank Beximco Pharma. They are a lot of trouble of last three months with us for technical support. Also, I acknowledged uh, Abbott Vascular. They are also with us. And thank you, Professor Abdul Rahman, sir, for your British deal with us. And Arun Maske from the Nepal. Also, Khaled Mosin, sir, Professor Abdul Wadu, sir, to Pradif. Thank you, everybody. Professor Ten, as Padusha said, uh, you will come again in the virtual class if you ask you if you have enough time. Please give another lecture. I think you next month or two or month. I will ask you send a letter if you feel free. Give another lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Dharma and Dakahave. 
দেখা হবে ইনশাআল্লাহ দেখা হবে थैंक यू স্যার थैंक यू স্যার ভালো থাকেন আসসালামু আলাইকুম বাই 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 थैंक यू স্যার